Welcome to Nazarene Israel. I'm your host, Norma Willis, and this is Parasha Shalach for 2022. And in this parasha, we're going to zoom way in on this Hebrew word shalach because it illustrates the right relationship we are to have with our Elohim. In other words, it illustrates the righteousness we are to have with our Elohim. So what's this Hebrew word shalach all about? And how does it relate to the shaliachim? And why is it so vital that we understand and live the same societal structure that Yahweh uses biblically if we are to please our Elohim? In other words, if we want to please Yahweh, don't we have to adopt his culture? Join us for Parashah Shalach so we can find out why Yahweh's culture is so important for us in Ephraim to adopt today. The Hebrew term shalach is Strong's Hebrew Concordance number 7971, and it's a primitive root that means simply to send away or to send out. And we saw in other places that the Hebrew term for an apostle is a shaliach, or a sent one. But here's the thing. If someone is sent, doesn't someone have to do the sending? And who is it that has to do the sending in order for someone to qualify as a shaliach? Well, for most of us growing up in democracy, we've forgotten completely what the, minds, the mindset of a kingship is all about. We can't relate to life under a kingship. Because in democracy, if we get an idea and we want to do something, we just do it. It's freedom, it's liberty, completely. But under a kingship, the king's ministers need to review everything to make sure it's not going to compromise national security, make sure it's not going to help our enemies, make sure it's going to build the kingdom long term. So that's why in a kingship, the king will send out his ministers to do his bidding and to carry out his work. Well, in a very real sense, after Mount Sinai, when we signed up and said our I do's, we have become effectively his ministers. So we are effectively agents of his kingdom, so to speak, if we are sent by him and we're not self-elected, and if we stick to our roles. Now, we're going to see the problems of being self-elected a little later on in this parasha. <laughs> because if we decide to send ourselves, that's not the same thing as the king of the universe sending us. Just by way of information for those of you ministers with your own independent ministries. In scripture, a shaliach, or a sent one, is a shaliach precisely because Yahweh sends him to do something special for him. He has a commission, so to speak. And again, later in this parasha, we're going to see that we don't get to send ourselves. That's called self-idolatry, and it carries a huge punishment. And then next week, we're going to see that it seems like no matter whom Elohim sends, it seems like our forefathers always reject them. At least that's the pattern shown in Scripture. And to speak the truth in love, that's basically the same problem as most of us in Ephraim labor under as well without even realizing it. People say, well, how so? Well, to briefly recap the big picture view, Yahweh originally created us humans to shema, meaning to hear and obey his voice. And the very first thing that he commanded us was to tend and keep the garden. But there were several implicit assumptions he expected us also to love our brothers and to take care of our brothers and to serve as our brothers' keepers. But we didn't want to do that. So instead, we chose the route of selfishness. We chose not to take care of the earth. We chose not to take care of our brothers. But we chose to trash our home and to get ahead of our brothers and to get a leg up on our brothers. Well, this kind of selfish thinking is basically what's made it possible that we have the societal situation of today where men are following effectively the way of Babylon, where the rich and powerful use their wealth and power for their own personal betterment at the expense of everyone else, at the expense of all their brothers and sisters. So we're effectively staring that end game in the face right now every week as we read the news with the coming of the Sabatine Franklist globalist world order. 
So we know from our studies in Revelation and the end times that they're not going to win it. They're going to lose. They don't know that. They're going to find out the hard way. But we also know that the only way that we get to be kept from the hour of trial is by joining and participating in the assembly of Philadelphia, or the assembly of true brotherly love. Okay, well, there's rules for that. And what that means is that rather than trying to get ahead of our brothers at the expense of our brothers, at the expense of the planet, rather, we need to serve our brothers. We need to take care of our home according to everything that Elohim's voice ever said for us to do. That's the only way to end up with peace on earth long term. Now the world's going to plunge itself into darkness before we realize that, before Elohim saves us and shortens the days of tribulation. But what we need to do on our end is that we need to organize according to his word so that we can help him build his kingdom. We need to make ourselves available to be sent by him. And there's never been a better time than right now, because effectively, we take a step back and we look at the big picture view, basically, Yahweh sent his son to take back a rebellious world through love. But if we don't respond to the love of Elohim's son 100% and hear his word, read his word and do the things he says to do, then what good are we to him as sent ones? And what good are we to him as a bride? But it's tricky because Yahweh uses a different system than we use, and we need to understand it. For those of us who've grown up under voting and democracy and elections, Yahweh uses a completely different system that operates on completely different assumptions. Because effectively, democracy is rebellion. Democracy is based on the premise that we are all sovereign, And this is our power sharing strategy between us. We all agree to yield a portion of our sovereignty to a central red horse government, which as we explained in the study on Revelation, the end times is effectively here to destroy us because the red horse is not our friend. Only Yahweh, our Elohim is our friend. So in order to be in his protection, we have to adopt his culture. We have to adopt his commanded form of government. That's our job right now in Nazarene Israel. Now, what we need to understand is that scripture is based on the premise, well, the world operates on the assumption that the majority is usually right. And so that's how democracy operates, is whatever is the majority rule, whatever the mob wants, the mob gets, because we think that whatever seems good and right in our own eyes is what we ought to vote for. When Yahweh says that way leads only to death, So the assumption in scripture is that the majority of the people are usually dead wrong because we're only human. We're people. And Yaakov also tells us that the things that we seek after, the things of the world, those are opposed to the things of the flesh. They're diametrically opposed. The two things are opposites. And the problem is that even if you tried to make democracy work the right way, the problem is that most people get their passions and their emotions confused for Elohim's spirit. They can't tell the difference between their emotionality and what Elohim is saying through his spirit. So typically speaking, what happens for Elohim to bring order to his people, because he is an Elohim of order, typically what he does historically is he sends either one man or a small group of men who know how to rule their own spirits and who also know how to submit to the spirit of Elohim. They don't get caught up in emotionalism. They're able to hear Yahweh's voice and to speak and to act according to it. And those are the people Yahweh our Elohim works through. For example, Yahweh sent Moshe to draw our forefathers out of the land of Egypt and to bring us into covenant relationship with him. And then now in this parasha, Moshe himself is told to send out spies, to spy out the land of Israel. And all through scripture, we see this kind of agency relationship where the king or the leader, in this case, Yahweh, sends out his agents to do his bidding. And that's effectively what a shiliach or an apostle is, is Yahweh's agent called and sent out for a specific purpose or mission. And that purpose or mission can be very broad, it can be very general, like the Great Commission, or it can be very specific. But if the king is the one sending, it's always in line with building Elohim's true kingdom. 
It's always in line with his original purpose, which is to cause a broken and fallen, rebellious mankind to submit to his son in love. That's the ultimate goal here. So everything that is done must be in keeping with Elohim's ultimate goal. So in our Torah portion, beginning in Bamidbar or Numbers chapter 13, Yahweh tells Moshe to send out spies, to spy out the land. And kind of funny, uh, the word in Hebrew is Strong's Hebrew 8446, tour. So when you go to the land of Israel and you tell them, what is your purpose? And you say tourism, they go, aha, they're here to spy out the land. It's Ephraim. So once again, what we're going to see is the two houses in action. We're going to see Judah send out Caleb, the son of Yefuna. And we're going to see the tribe of Ephraim send out Hoshea, the son of Nun. And then in verse 16, we're going to see how Moshe called Hoshea, the son of Nun, by a new name, Yehoshua, or in English we say Joshua, but Yehoshua. If you'd like to know how the name of Hoshea ben Nun became Yehoshua, and then later Yeshua, please check out our study on the set-apart names in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 1. We also have a video on the same subject. But as we explain in the Nazarene Israel study, Caleb and Joshua represent what are called the two houses of Israel. And you can read all about that and why that's so important in the Nazarene Israel study. But so what happens in the parasha? Well, verse 25 tells at the end of 40 days, the spies return back from spying out the land, from touring the land, being tourists. And of course, 10 of the tourists bring back a bad report and they focus on all the negatives. They're very pessimistic. Doesn't it seem like there's always a whiner around here somewhere? So they had the wrong focus. They're focused on all the negatives. They're forgetting about Yahweh. But then in verse 30, Caleb jumps up and quiets the people before Moshe. He says, let's go up at once and occupy it because we're well able to overcome it because we have Yahweh on our side. We have nothing to fear. If Yahweh is sending us, if our Elohim is sending us, we know he's the true Elohim, we can do it. But the 10 spies said, no, we we can't go up against the people because even though Yahweh is on our side, Well, and even though Yahweh just trashed Egypt, and even though Yahweh just brought judgment on all the gods of Egypt, and even though Yahweh just parted the Reed Sea for us, and even though we're receiving a miracle of manna daily, and even though we have the column of fire and cloud over the tabernacle, both by day and by night, there's all kinds of things going on. We can't explain by anything other than supernatural means. Mount Sinai is on a smoke. Moshe is gone for 40 days. All kinds of things. These are miracles going on that defy explanation. And so our forefathers cried out, no, we can't go up because they're stronger than we are. So what this is saying is there's no real faith in Yahweh. Just like Ephraim doesn't show real faith in Yahweh, that if we will do everything he says to do, that he will take care of us. And if we don't do everything he says to do, we aren't going to make it back home. Chapter 14. So then all the congregation raises a loud cry, and our forefathers cried and wept all night. Well, then in verse 4, <laughs> we see our Babylonian tendencies, our red horse genetic tendencies at work, because our forefathers wanted to elect or select or vote for their own leader and then go back to Egypt. So, what's the difference with that in democracy? When in democracy, we think, what's wrong with that? That's the people are exercising their right to choose. But the problem is, under kingship, we don't get a right to choose. We have a right to choose who we're going to submit to as our king and whether or not we're going to be faithful, meaning whether or not he's going to have to kill us all for treason in the tribulation. And that's basically all the choices we get. But, and we should be ecstatic about it. We should be literally in ecstasy all the time that Yahweh has called us to suffer these things for him and to do his bidding and to be his servants. We're supposed to give thanks for this in all things and at all times because we're called to be his slaves. We're supposed to rejoice because he has the victory over our flesh and because we have died the same death that Yeshua has died and we're raised in the same resurrection that Yeshua was raised in. Now we're raised into his spirit. Yes, we're called to a role as a a slave, 
but we're called in the role of a slave princess. What's wrong with being a slave princess to the king of the universe's son? Brothers and sisters, we just need to humble ourselves, to humbly accept the position. (laughs) Do we understand what we're being given? It's like someone hands you a platter filled with gold and silver and diamonds and gemstones, and we're like, we don't want it. It's too much work. We have to go. We have inconveniences. We just don't like it. (laughs) You know, so humility doesn't come easily to us. Neither does trust. We don't trust Yahweh. We don't submit to Yahweh, or we would do all the things that Elohim says. So then in verse 5, Moshe and Aharon fall on their faces because the people are rebelling against their king. They're rebelling against the one who shalaked them, who sent them. So then we see the leaders of the two houses, Joshua the son of Nun, symbolic of the tribe of Ephraim, Caleb the son of Yephuna, symbolic of the house of Judah. They tore their clothes and they said, no, the land is an exceedingly good land. If we respond in trust and Yahweh delights in us, He will bring us into the land that he promised. But don't rebel against Yahweh, because that's what it was. It was rebellion against the king who shalaked them. And by the way, while we're here, uh, we should mention that uh, Joshua was second to jump up. So we jumped up only after Caleb had already jumped up. That's why the land was promised to Caleb. That's why Judah was brought back home to the land first. And we talk about how the end times play out in our study on Revelation and the end times. Okay, verse 11. Yahweh said to Moshe, how long will these people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me, despite all the many myriad multitude of signs that I've done among them? Uh, So far, our ancestors, we've seen Yahweh just trash Egypt, trash their gods. Everything Yahweh has said has come to pass. But still, we don't believe him. We're watching daily miracles of manna, daily miracles of the column and fire and cloud. We see his hand. We see our forefathers saw his protection. But we rebelled against our king. We rebelled against the one who sent us because we spent a whole year at the foot of Mount Sinai organizing and building the tabernacle. Now here it is a year later, Yahweh is sending us as a bridal nation out on a mission for him but we don't want to do it. We only wanted the land of milk and honey if it's easy. We don't want to tithe. We don't want to work. We don't want to volunteer. We don't want to do anything. Doesn't make Yahweh happy. Verse 37. And all the men who brought up a bad report died by plague. So because they had a focus on the negative. Now there's always somebody looking for some reason why we can't do what Yahweh's word says to do today. There's always some reason that that we don't have to do it or we can't do it or whatever, but they're looking for excuses. They're looking for reasons to get out of what Yahweh said to do instead of looking for ways to show Yahweh their love by doing what Yahweh hopes that we will do. But that's what he's giving us. He's giving us an opportunity to excel. And how many of us, we know that we're called, so we assume that we are chosen because we are called even though we haven't chosen to respond to his call. So Caleb, the son of Yefuna, uh, and also Joshua, the son of Nun, they remained alive through the whole time because they looked for the positive. They brought a good report. They diligently sought that which was good instead of focusing on that which was bad. So again, they're the representatives of the two houses, Ephraim and Judah. and You can read all about that in the Nazarene Israel study. So now in verse 39, we have more drama, trauma among our ancestors. So Moshe told these words to the people and our ancestors mourned greatly. So then what did we do? Well, we got up early in the morning. We went up to the heights of the hill country. We said, here we are, (laughs) choose us. Now we will go up to the land which Yahweh has promised. We'll go to the place which Yahweh has promised. And what does Moshe say? He says, what do you think you're doing? Yahweh didn't send you to go anywhere. Your king didn't shalak you. Okay? You're shalaking yourselves. It doesn't work. You're going to die. So they didn't listen. So, of course, the Amalekites and the Canaanites 
who lived in that hill country came down and defeated them and pursued them even to Hormah. So that's what happens when we decide to send ourselves. Uh, so all those independent ministers who aren't building Yeshua's unified kingdom based on a single foundation of apostles and prophets, based on the principle of the fivefold ministry, uh, what are you doing? In an end time context, if you're building your own little ministry, you're building your own little ministry kingdom, what are you doing in an end time context? We don't get to send ourselves. Before we go on to our half to a prophetic portion, first let's take a look at something special here in Babidbar chapter 15, starting in verse 37. Yahweh said to Moshe, Speak to the children of Israel, the people of Israel, and tell them to make tassels or tzitzit on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. That means it applies to today. And put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at to remember to do all the commandments of Yahweh to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes after which you are inclined to whore. And the whole point here is that we're no longer to do what we want because we are his servants. We're his slaves, willingly. And that's what it is to be a slave, is we no longer have rights to ourselves. We no longer have legal rights. We no longer have a free will because we're not free. We're slaves, so we don't get to exercise our own free will. And that's what this little blue tassel is exactly a reminder of, is that we don't get to do our own will. Uh, We don't get to follow our own heart and our own eyes and our own desires. We don't get to send ourselves. Now, in a democracy, we could just send ourselves wherever we want. (laughs) There's no problem. We can start a ministry. You know, we have a Bible and a camera. We can be in ministry. We're not building Yeshua's unified kingdom, so it doesn't really truly work for Yahweh's ultimate purposes. But we can do whatever we want because we're in a democracy, but not under kingship. Because under kingship, really, we're all just soldiers. We're part of our war Elohim's armies. And that's what this little blue tassel says, is that we are no longer the harlot after our own eyes and our own desires. So if you want to understand this in more detail, in the Torah calendar study, near the end of the book, we have a chapter called About Service. And the point of the chapter is that the way Elohim looks at things, whatever we pay attention to, that's what we're serving. So that's what we consider worthy of our time. That's what we consider worthy of our attention. So that's effectively what we worship. And this gets very deep. It's a very simple principle, but when we take into account, we take a look at where do we spend our time? Where do we spend our money? What do we pay attention to? Uh, In the language of Scripture, what we pay attention to, that's effectively what we worship. So if we're worshiping a cross, that's if we may not realize that that's the sign of the demon Tammuz, but it's the sign of the demon Tammuz. So if we're looking upon a cross and gazing upon a cross and trying to think of Yeshua or Jesus, as the case may be, that's idolatry. That's not doing the things Elohim says to do. That's not keeping the second commandment. So if we do the things that Elohim says to do, then and only then, in the language of the Bible, Yahweh considers that we consider him worthy to tell us what to do. Someone who's worthy to tell us what to do, we worship him because we consider him worthy to give him our attentions. But if we don't do what Yahweh says to do, if we don't hear his voice and we don't read his word and do everything he has commanded the way he tells us to do it, then in Yahweh's thinking, we don't consider him worthy to be our Elohim. So no matter what we might think, no matter what we might say, he doesn't consider that we are worshiping him because we don't consider him worthy to be the one to establish everything we do as a unified nation worldwide. And that's also effectively the case with the rabbinic tzitzit, is that they don't obey the Torah. They're obeying their own traditions and teachings. And that's because the rabbis tell us to 
color are tsetse blue with the mucus gland of the murex trunculus sea snail. So there's all sorts of studies out there on the internet. If you kill a sea snail, murex trunculus, at certain times of day, you can extract the dye from the gland and it makes the, the dye from the mucus gland either purple or blue or sometimes red even. But you're coloring your seat seat with sea snail snot. And not only that, it's an unclean animal. In Vaikra or Leviticus chapter 11 in verse 10, it tells us we are to abominate the carcass of anything that lives in the water, like a sea snail, that does not have fins or scales. And the Murex trunculus sea snail doesn't have fins or scales. Therefore, according to Yahweh, we are supposed to abominate the Murex trunculus sea snail, not soak our seat seat in its snot. So now we come to our after a prophetic portion. So we come to Joshua or Yehoshua chapter two. We see the same thing. We see a shalaching. We see Joshua sending spies on a mission. But what we need to notice here is the reason they, that anyone is ever sent is always to build Yahweh's kingdom. It's always to further his greater overall purpose, which is to bring the earth in subjection to his son. And then Elohim shall be all in all. That's always why anyone is truly ever sent, is to help further Yahweh's cause and build Yeshua's unified kingdom in this age. Notice, the spies don't send themselves. They are sent by the one who is placed in authority so that it can be a unified operation. It can be one operation, one single body, not a whole bunch of independent messianics running around minister here, a minister there, here a minister, there a minister, everywhere a rabbi. They don't do that in scripture. Okay, so now let's go to our Brit Hadashah, or our renewed covenant portion, and we see Yeshua sending out his shaliachim, or his apostles. It's literally the act of sending them out on mission for Yeshua, which makes them shaliachim. There's no other qualification for a shaliach, or an apostle. Uh, A lot of independent apostles, a lot of rogue apostles, a lot of rogue ministers doing their own thing out there. Uh, Let's take a look at where we are, friends, brothers, sisters. We're in the end times. If there was ever a time to be doing Yeshua's program, this is the time, and he has a program. We talk about that in our study on Torah government and also in Acts chapter 15 order. But notice here, the way it goes is your king or his delegate is the one to shalach you or send you. So now you become a shaliach because he is the one who sent you. The spirit sends us. We'll see in just a bit. There's also different kinds of shaliachim. So first we have the ecclesiastical or the ministerial kind of shaliach that everyone thinks about. Okay, well, then you also have another kind of shaliach. Back in ancient times, you also had messengers or runners who were also sent. Well, that, the act of sending them out makes them a shaliach, whether or not they are anointed to teach or whether they're simply a runner. Now, if you want to know more, we have a study on that in Acts, or excuse me, in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 3, called Junia, Woman Apostle or Courier. But, and this explains the different kinds of shaliachim, or the different kinds of sent ones. But the point we need to get from all this is that Yahweh's service is not a democracy. It's a kingship. It's effectively a benevolent dictatorship. So the king shalaks his shaliachim to do his bidding, or he appoints someone to send someone else out. But there's an order to it. There's a unified order to it that's missing from the Messianic world. It's missing from what's called the Ephraimite movement from independent messianics. They, they don't understand that the message of this is a shaliach is just a soldier. That's all he is. A shaliach's job is to listen to Yeshua's spirit and then diligently do what he's told, including everything that was ever said before by the spirit, because we're accountable to everything in scripture, not just parts of it, not just the convenient, broad, easy walk parts. You know, we have to do in faith what Elohim tells us to do, and then we have to trust that Elohim's going to deliver us. 
And that's what scripture speaks of. So are we doing that or are we learning about what we should be doing? Is a question for each one of us to ask the Father Yahweh in prayer. Would you please show us the truth? Show us whether or not we're in the faith. So now let's come to Acts chapter 13 or Maase 13. And we're going to see all of these elements in play in just a few short verses here. Now, first, we had the assembly that was in Antioch, which is in modern-day Turkey, and there were certain prophets and teachers. One of them was Barnava or Bar- not Barnabas. We also had Shimon called Niger or Black. It's probably because he was of African or Hamite extraction. You had some others. And as they were ministering to Yahweh and fasting, the set-apart spirit, which is the one that we need to listen to, It's the set-apart spirit that directs. And the spirit said, Now separate or set apart unto me Barnava and Shaul for the work to which I have called them. It says, And then, having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and then sent them away. So it's that very act of being sent out on mission, on their task, that's what makes a shaliach. Elohim sends you out. The Spirit sends you out. You don't just decide, well, I've got a Bible and a camera, and now I'm in ministry. Okay. That's what's called sending yourself. And it doesn't end well. And next week, we're going to see that almost no matter who our Elohim sent, our forefathers would always reject them in favor of doing their own thing, of harloing after their own desires and calling it the will of Elohim. So brothers and sisters, those of us who are of the faith, you call yourself a messianic or an independent or an Ephraimite or whatever you call yourself, are we all obeying Yeshua's word? Are we obeying Yahweh's word? Or are we doing our own thing? Are we simply learning about Yeshua and calling it the worship of Yeshua? We're not actually doing everything he says to do, but rather we're making up our own version that seems more pleasing to us. If we're willing to receive it, that's what the vast majority of Ephraimites and Messianics are doing, is effectively rejecting what Yeshua says to do in favor of creating their own broader, easier road that doesn't look like the faith of the first century. Please join us in praying for them that they might wake up before it's too late as we're entering into the end times. Shabbat Shalom.